So this morning, I just want to continue with our message. We've been talking about, we're starting a series, last week we started a series about the kingdom uh, of God. But particularly, we're talking about uh, the kingdom of God uh, being the message of the, of the kingdom of God being a good news. And uh, we take that, for those of you who want to look at the Bible, uh, in Matthew 24. In Matthew 24, we know the story very well. And the story in Matthew 24 is that Jesus is asking a question. And the question is about when he was returning. The, and the disciple came to him and they said, Lord, when are you coming back? And he said, they asked him also, what are the signs of your coming? So Jesus addresses that question about the end time. And so he starts by listing all the bad news and the bad things that are going to happen, you know, wars and rumors of wars, pestilences, famine, you know, in the middle of a pestilence or pandemic, whatever you want to call it. So Jesus talks about all these things that are not really positive, they're not really nice things. And he says, these things must happen. Make sure that you are not troubled because those things inevitably are going to happen. They are part of the, the birth pain. You know, there's a, something new that is about to happen, and so these things are to be expected. They're going to happen, they're going to take place, so do not be troubled by that. But what was interesting, in verse 14, Jesus finally answers the question as to when will we end? And he says, and this gospel, this good news of the kingdom, will be preached to all nations, then the end will come. And so you can see that for the Lord, uh, the gospel uh, of the kingdom seem to be the answer to all these problems, all these challenges that the world face. You know, he is the prince of peace and he comes and says, this gospel of the kingdom must be prepared. So, this is why we start this series, because the Lord is really challenging us to say, well, if this is so important, then it's important for us to have clarity as a church, as the body of Christ. What gospel are we presenting? Because sometimes gospel means good news. Sometimes uh, the way we present the gospel doesn't come across as good news. Uh, sometimes people hear bad news instead of good news. Um, but Jesus said that the good news of the gospel will be free. And so this series, I told the church, it's going to be, I don't know how, how many sessions we're going to have. Because I'm listening and as the Lord, um, you know, download these things, I'm just sharing with you. Um, so it's really very hot from the oven, okay? It's coming quite hot and fresh. And so I hope that you are able to enjoy this morning. And so today we're going to continue. And what I want to look at is the connection between the Garden of Eden and the Kingdom. Is that a connection? And those of you who know me know that I always I like to go back. I always start from the beginning. Genesis is an amazing book. Um, if you listen to the Lord and if you listen to the text, there's so much. Uh, that the Lord can speak to you about it. And so today that's what we're going to do. And this way, if you move on to the next, again, I thought I'll show you this beautiful picture. Um, uh, you know, the reference is there for those who want to find that online. It's quite an interesting picture about, you know, an artist's impression of the Garden of Eden, what it looked like, okay? And so if we move on to the next one, this way, um, we're going to start with our first readings. And we're going to be really starting by focusing more on the life in Eden. And uh, we're going to be talking a lot about these two trees in the garden. Um, what is the significance of these trees and how that relates to the whole idea of the kingdom of God. So there's a lot to share with you, uh, so uh, bear with me. Let's read from uh, Genesis chapter 2. Uh, let's read from verse 8. And it says here, And the Lord God planted a garden, is where he eaten. And there he put the man whom he had formed, and out of the ground the Lord made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then as we carry on to chapter 3, he said, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, 
to know good and evil. And now, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. And then skip to verse uh, verse 24 and say, And so he drew out at the man and he placed the cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So what I want to do this morning is really to paint a picture. I see there's a lot of text, but I'm going to go with the flow and show you some text as we go along. I just want to spend a bit of time to really paint that picture uh, in terms of God's heart and intention. And just ready to move to the next one. Um, to try and look at God's heart and intention because the whole idea of the kingdom of God has got to do with a plan that God really has conceived within himself. And so in Genesis we begin to see that. And if we try to uh, understand God's heart, God's intention of why he even created us, I think we're going to start to have an idea of why the message of the kingdom is so important, why it's so critical, and why it's such a good news for us today. So, just imagine this. This God that we didn't know, we didn't exist, decided one day that he was going to create the world. Okay, why? No idea. He just thought, I will create the world. So he created the world, and we know the story of Genesis, so we're not going to go over that again. But I just want to bring us to Eden. So, after creating all these amazing things, it seems that there wasn't enough. God created man, but he takes time and he planted a garden. Who among you are, are gardeners? Do you like, who like gardening? Right? Okay, we're we'll good gardeners here. And so I'm sure you enjoy good gardens. We've been to France a few times, and some of our favorite things is to find a good garden. And to go in, we spend a whole day there. I mean, it's hard to believe that human beings who are using, because of the fall, are using less than 10% of their brain capacity, are able to, you know, to come up with such amazing, breathtaking gardens that we absolutely enjoy. And when I think about the God who created the universe as a gardener, planting a garden in Eden from Adam, I mean, this is, I don't know about you, but it is, I, 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 I struggle to get my head around it. I would love to see what that, that garden looked like. Yes. <laughs> I would love to see that because it's an impressive garden. So God not only creates Adam, but he plants a garden. He takes time, he plants a garden, and then he gives a detail of that garden. And as I said, you know, you know that story, so I'm just going to go so that we, we can save time. And as you read the text, it tells you that in that garden, there's a river in the middle of that garden, and that river starts to flow from that garden. The, the river divides into four. Um, then he goes on to describe the fact that some of those rivers are connected to precious stones like onyx and, and gold. And, I mean, you can, this is like the, the idea of really paradise, and that's why it's called the Garden of Delight. It's the Garden of Eden, and that's what you know, Eden means, it means delight. So that already from there we can see God's heart and intention for man, is that he creates man and he creates this amazing and beautiful environment. See, our idea of you know, jetting up to the exotic locations you know, comes from very far. <laughs> okay. We have it from the beginning because this is what God made. You know, we're going to go to Barbados and all this thing. I mean, it's, not, it's, it's built into us because this is why we were made. God created us for us to enjoy life to its fullness. And He wanted to give us the best. But that doesn't end there. Not only does all this the amazing thing, but he planted, he put the tree of life. <laughs> and that's why we'll talk a little bit about the tree of life, because for me, the whole Genesis story, our, our ancestors' attitude toward the tree of life really baffles me always. Because the tree of life is a tree that gives you eternal life. It's a tree that gives you life forever. So it means that from the very beginning, we were made not to die, but to live. So that's why God put the tree of life. That's why we fight death. We know we're going to die, but who enjoyed dying? No, who enjoyed enjoy dying. Why? Because we were never created and made to die. We were made and created to live. 
And so apart to this environment that God, you know, that decor that God, you know, put together, he planted in the middle of that garden the tree of life. And that's why I wanted to show that video, because the video shows that it wasn't a small tree, okay? You couldn't miss it. Yeah. <laughs> it was there. It's beautiful. And then next to it, of course, there's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so this brings us to what is really going on in the garden. And today, you know, there's a question that's asked over and over again, well, if God knew everything, why the tree of knowledge of good and evil was there? And that question, you know, we're going to be debating until um, Jesus comes back. But for me, what I want to see is God's intention. Why? Why will He create us? Why will He, you know, put all these amazing things around us? Things that man needs, things that God knows that we need. And then He put the tree of life there, uh, and He put the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Just let's just continue. Um, and so, you know, in order to understand, you know, what is going on here, really, um, it's important for us to. You know, people want to know God, they want to know about God, but they want to fight Him. <laughs> okay? It's like a, you know, a student who goes to, you know, to the amphitheater and they just want to learn, but then they start arguing with, the, you know, with their teacher. Um, they don't trust Him, they don't like Him, and then they want the knowledge. And it's important for us to really submit ourselves to the Lord and say, Lord, what is really going on here? Can you teach us something? Just so if you, if you carry on. Now, there's something that I want to say about Eden. Because Eden is more than what we think. And the reason why I think it's more than what we think is that there's a creature who was in Eden that was known as the serpent, that's known as Lucifer, the devil, later on. And Ezekiel actually paints a picture of you know, the fall of Lucifer. And there's quite something interesting. I said, another time that we see Eden mentioned, and look at what it says here. And he's talking about Lucifer here. He said, and you are in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. Sardis, topaz, diamond, uh, beryl, onyx, we remember onyx from, from the text, and justice, a fire, topaz, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your temple and pipe was prepared for you on the day you were created. So we read that even this Creature was in Eden, covered with precious stones. So one of the things that we see in Eden is that Eden wasn't just a simple garden. Because you see, Eden wasn't a garden for man, or just for man. Eden was a garden of God. Because remember, the Bible says that God planted a garden, right? I don't think you plant a garden and somebody said that it's their garden. God planted a garden. So therefore, the garden of Eden is God's own garden. So he planted his own garden and he put man in that garden. And so what we see in Eden is that God begin to express and show his intention. And the other intention is that God always wanted family. God wanted to always have a family. God wanted to, to dwell with man. And we see that later on in the book of Revelation, when we, we read in, in Revelation chapter, I think chapter 21, 22, where it says, Behold, the tabernacle of God with man, he will dwell with them. So we, God began to make his intention known that he created us so that he can be with us, so that we can be family. But you see, that wasn't enough. I'm going to come back to Eden in a minute. But God's desire to meet our needs was such, so amazing that God hasn't stopped there. Adam's got everything, right? He's got God. He's got all these beautiful things. He doesn't have to, you know, book a plane tickets. Everything was at his fingertip. But it wasn't enough. I'm just sure let's carry on. There's something that happens. So we see also later on, we read this text, and the Lord God said, it is not good that a man should be alone, and I will make him a helper comparable to him. So Adam gave name to all the cattle, the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. Then the rape which the Lord God has taken from man he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is not bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. So shall be called, uh, shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. So it has an end there. God said, okay, you've got the garden of paradise, you've got everything, you've got all the animals. What I love about the God of his servant is that 
He gives us an important gift, and we're going to look at that in a minute, which is that gift of free will. You see, when he wants Adam to realize that he needed something else, what God does is he brings all the animals. Adam named them. And then Adam at the end of his heart, he said, oh, there's none of them like a heart. <laughs> there's none of them like a cow. Maybe you can, uh, you know, you can have a dog in your lap or something like that. Something was missing, and God said, no, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not perfect. I want him to be happy. I want him to really, really, do, I don't want anything to be missing. I want him to be really full of life and excitement. So he brings the animals, Adam does, you know, name them and say, yeah, I like you well, I like the dog, the, you know, you are well. And then at one point something is missing. And God said, no, it's not good. It's that's not good enough. If you notice that in Genesis, every time God created something, the Bible says, and God said, this is good. So he's really fussy. I mean, you know, he wants to give the best because he's the best. And so he said, I'm going to make him a helper. But what is interesting in the story, he doesn't take the helper and say, Hello, Adam, you know, welcome back. Here's your wife. <laughs> no, he doesn't even impose Eve. He brings Eve and he presents Eve. This man wakes up. I love his reaction. Somebody said, he didn't say, this is the monkey of my monkey and the gorilla of my gorilla. He said, this is bone of my bone. This is flesh of my flesh. He's like, now you're talking, God. This is what was missing. I'm going to put my finger on it, but this is it. This is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. So he welcomed. And, 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 and so what I love is, is that collaboration between God and him. Is that this God can do everything. And yet, he's determined that he won't give the best to this man that he's created. And so Eve enters the scene. I'm sure Eve says something, but you know, we probably need a text. <laughs> Probably she said, who are you? You know, you are amazing. I'm not going to be there. <laughs> but, uh, but, but, but you know, it was really, and so God then goes on to say, for this reason, because Adam has really got it, and, you know, felt attracted and all that, from this reason, man will leave his mother and father, and return to his wife, and the two uh, become, will be, um, and will be one flesh. So you can see the picture of God is unfolding, the story is unfolding. So we can see that God is trying to give the best to man, and he meets all every need of man, and then we begin to see that for God to have a family, what well, that family had to grow, had to multiply, so Eve then get into the scene. So man has got the family now. So there's Adam and Eve, and there is God in the garden. And so everything is really set in place for the perfect life. Now, the next piece of the puzzle is to do with this one. Let's move on is to do with this whole idea of free will. Because you see, in the relationship that God wants to have with man, it's a relationship where God wants man, uh, doesn't want man to be a robot. You know, we human beings can be robots. Japanese are great, we don't robots. So God doesn't have a problem making robots. But that wasn't his plan, that was his heart. That was his, his intention. His intention was that he made man in his own image. And part of the image of, of God in man is the ability to have a free will. You say, well, dogs have free will too. Well, it's a, a different kind of free will. Usually it's choosing to eat, right? So if you put an apple there and you put a piece of meat here, we know, okay, the dog's gonna go. Well, some dogs are trained to eat apple, so um, I'm gonna be careful what I say. But we know generally they will go for the meat. That's a choice. But the free will that God has given us is a free will to do with moral choices. It's to do with choosing justice, what is right and what is wrong. And so this is where we address this question of the tree of knowledge of good and evil because people say, well, why did God do it? It's a good question. Why did God do it? But you see, what's the point of having a free will if there's no opportunity to exercise your free will? Now, let's use this simple example. Okay, I said there's a dinner party, okay, come to my house, and I say, it's going to be amazing, you know, I mean, come prepare, it's going to be, you know, wide selection, you know, of food or whatever, you know, you know, you dress up, you come and say, Patrice, okay, you sit down, a few tables there, and you're presented with chicken tikka wasabi. I don't even like curry or not. <laughs> okay. And you say, oh, okay, well, I wasn't thinking about that. Uh, and then you go to Andy's table and you say, Andy, what have you got there? Uh, chicken tikka masala. Oh, 
Hello, what have you got there? Chicken tikka masala. Right, okay. Hello, you? Chicken tikka masala. So, I've told you that you can choose to eat what you want to eat. That you have a choice. But all I present to you is chicken tikka masala. Am I giving you a choice or not? So the idea that, you know, we ask the question, why, why, why would God just, you know, put the tree of knowledge of evil? He put it because it was a test for us to use that free will. Now, God desires that we use that free will to follow him. Now, come on. You have someone, I mean, if someone gave us, you know, some ticket to go to the Caribbean and stuff like that, we'll be grateful. We'll say thank you. I mean, after everything that God has given, I mean, surely his intentions are clear. That he wants to be with man. That he really wants that relationship with man. But God says that relationship is not going to be one where I force you to do anything. I'm giving you what I've got myself, the free will. I want you to use that to choose life. Because the statement about life was clear. Because the tree of life was in the garden. And he said that, you know, you can eat of everything that the tree of knowledge of good and evil you cannot touch. And so this is the challenge that man faced, man faced right from the garden. And so the tree of life is supposed to give man the ability to live forever. That is important in that coming kingdom, that family that God is putting in place. It's important that man learn to use that free will that has been given. And so at the first hurdle, at the first test, obviously we know what happened. Man miserably, you know, failed. And um, you know, that text. Just for let's carry on. I think I've spoken about this already, so let's carry on. So God wanted man to choose life, and we see that in, in Deuteronomy 30, where Moses you know, stated clearly that God said that I put before you life and death. But I want you to choose life. And that's what happened in the Garden of Eden. God said, you know, you have the ability to live with me forever. Or you can choose to die. I mean, I find that amazing. I mean, I, if I was God, I'm not sure I want to do that. Because the free will is quite a powerful thing. Knowing that man can choose the wrong thing. And yet, but still, God's like, yeah, this is what I've determined. I don't want you to follow me like a robot. I want you to choose to follow me. It has to be a choice. It is dangerous, but I still want to trust you. So not only God did all this thing, but God also, you know, trusts man. And you should carry on. And this brings me to something that it's when I was looking at this message, the Lord really shed some light on this one. So I'm going to dwell on that a little bit. And then hopefully that will bring everything together and tie everything in. You see, in Deuteronomy, uh, there's this verse that Jesus uh, quotes in Matthew 4 for and Luke 4 for when he's tempted in, in the wilderness. And that's what he says in Deuteronomy 8, 8, 8 3. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your father know. That he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord God. See, this is very important. I've been very puzzled by that. Man shall leave by everyone. So when Jesus is hungry, he, for the, he, he's, he's, um, he's fasting 40 days and 40 nights fasting in the wilderness when he was hungry, the enemy uses, uh, in the scripture, to tempt him to say, you know, you turn, you can turn this stone into bread and eat. And Jesus called this scripture. And it's very important. And in, in Genesis, we see the whole meaning of this passage and this verse. Why? Because here we are. Man is made of spirit, soul, and body. And Joshua, I don't know if I go on my next, uh, on my next one. Yeah, I think it's, we see that in um, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5. And God, where Paul says, And now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and, and, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus. So man is made of body, of, of spirit, soul, and body. And if you look at what happened in the garden, you can see that God was determined to make sure that all the parts of man being were taken care of. So with the uh, garden paradise, we can see that all the bodies, you know, the, the, the needs of the body are taken care of. And of course, today with the pandemic, we know that nature is 
important for us, for our well-being. We know that, you know, if you can get out to get some fresh air and all that, but they have better. So part of the psychological, you know, emotional, all that need is taken by, you know, the, the garden paradise. Of course, Eve comes in. Why? Because there was something else that was missing in man. And so Eve helped uh, with that companionship. But there's something else that is important. Man is also made of spirit. And the question is, what does the spirit eat? <laughs> okay. If your body, you know, if your body eats food and, you know, uh, whatever is your favorite food, and if you enjoy, <laughs> you know, uh, before I say chicken to get myself, you think that that's all I eat? No, that's not the case. <laughs> but, um, you know, so here's the question. So emotionally and psychologically, our needs, are taken care of. And Eve plays a big part in that. But the question is, what does the body, uh, what does the, the spirit eat? You see, this is where the tree of the knowledge of good and evil come into the picture. And this one is important. Because everything is, is taken care of, okay, but apart from one aspect. And one aspect of, uh, uh, of the need of man is that man was meant to live by every word that stems from the mouth of God. You see, the idea, when God says, here's the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and here's the tree of life, God was hoping that man would understand that he's taking care of everything else, but that other need, that spiritual need, is met by the presence of God himself, you see. When you read the text, you have the impression, particularly the way the, the, the serpent uses phrase the question. Look at what the serpent says. He says, the reason why God doesn't want you to eat that tree is because God knows that if you eat of that tree, you'll be like him. So there's a clue there that that tree is a tree that only God can touch and eat. Does that make sense? Because I told you that it's God's garden. <laughs> oh God, okay, we just did it. And so God is incorruptible. He can't die. He can touch that tree. He can eat it. No problem. But man can't. Because man will die. He can die. And so God will touch it. So the question is, did God intentionally not want man to know good and evil? No. God want man to know good and evil. But God wanted man to turn to him. Yes. To learn good and evil. Does that make sense? Yes. That's the whole point. He said, this is the tree of God and evil here. That's, you can go your own way. You can try and find out good and evil by yourself. Or you can learn for myself. And so the idea that man will understand that he's taking care of every other need, but there's another need, which is my spiritual need. And that spiritual need is met by feeding of every word that comes from his mouth. And so God wanted that fellowship in the garden. And we've all heard about the fact that every human being has got this God-shaped hole. You heard the expression? That every human has got this God-shaped hole in the heart. That's where this has come from. Because the only way the spirit will be taken care of, your spirit will be fed, is through that intimacy relationship with God. And, um, and this is why this one, this I'm going to try and wrap it up. Okay, back to that. Um, so, if you look at um, these passages here, um, oh, this one, go back. I think there's, there's one other passage there. Go back again. I think I missed something. Yeah, okay, that's the that's John 6 63. Jesus says something else that's very important. He said, It is the spirit who gives life, the flesh profit nothing. The word that I speak to you are spirits, and they are life. You see what Jesus is saying? He's saying that the word that I'm speaking, when I speak to you, what you receive, yeah, you hear you hear word, you hear sound, but the spiritual essence that is communicated, that is imparted to you. So when I speak to you, it's spirit in essence and it's life. So in other words, when I speak to you, I give you life. I sustain you. So man was meant to live by every single word. So every time you have this, 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 you know, this contact with God, you are actually feeding your spirit. And this is why in the book of Joshua, God gave this command to Joshua. He said, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in the in it for then you that uh, you will make your way prosperous then you will have good success look at that that's what he wanted in the garden he said the way for you to be prosperous the way for you to really to to be fulfilled in life 
is that this book shall not depart from your mouth. You know, feed on the day and night. Why? Because you've got a spirit. You see, you're not fulfilled. Yes, you can eat the best food in the world. You know, you can get emotionally, you know, taken care of. But if your spirit is not taken care of, you are not, you can't say that you enjoy life to the full. And that's why human beings go for a spiritual quest. You know, people are looking for enlightenment. And, you know, in every generation of human beings, spirituality has been something that, despite what the atheists are saying, they're saying, it's not something that they can quench. There are more people who believe in things, it might not be our God, but there are more human beings who believe in things that those who don't believe in anything. Because that need is there. You, you can't, sh- it is there. It doesn't matter what you say. Because it was part of our makeup. Because a human being has got a spirit. As long as you've got a spirit, that need, you'll be craving that thing. And so this pursuit of enlightenment and, you know, people meditate till, you know, their face with the, you know, the air, the atmosphere, whatever. You know, the key is here that it's the word of God. It is that fellowship. It's that relationship. And that's why Jesus gives that beautiful picture. Just right, if you go to the next one. There's a beautiful picture. Yeah, let's carry on. I want to try and wrap it up. Yeah, yeah, carry on. Um, Jesus gave this beautiful picture about uh, the vine and the branches. And this is what he says here. He said, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abide in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, I in him, bear much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is with it. And they gather them and throw them into the fire. And they are burnt. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So you will be, um, you will be my disciples. What's the commandment that God gave them after he made Adam and Eve? Multiply and be be fruitful. So we were meant to be fruitful in every aspect of it, right? And he says, you know, just as I am the vine. So in that original contract and concept, God is the vine. And we are the branches. And just as you cannot, if you break away the branch, it will happen. The branch dies. And this is where we see the whole idea of eternal life because, you see, the Bible said that if you believe in Christ, even if you die, you live. Why? Because, you see, your spirit is connected to him. See, when you give your life to Jesus, you are connected to the source of life. So your body might die, but you're plugged to the main. <laughs> okay? If you think in terms of electricity, right? So you still got power. You still got life. So your body might die. Now, because you are here, because you are connected, because you are abiding in, because you are connected to the source of life, even when the time comes when you and I will go, the Bible says that we leave because the Spirit doesn't die. And we are connected to Him. And so this is what the whole idea of God wanting to have a family, a family made of men and women who are made of His own image, who can choose for themselves, who can choose life, who can choose to live in, in all abundance, you know, to, 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 to live to the full in that garden, and God said multiply and be fruitful and fill the whole planet. That was the whole plan. That's what God wanted. But of course, we know what happens. They're messing all up. And I'm going to end here, Joshua. I'm going to go to the, the, the last uh, slides. And I want to show you something. I'm not going to dwell on that. But I want to show you a few things, and I'm going to pray. You see... When they are eating the tree of life, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the Bible says that God says, okay, they've eaten of the tree of, good, uh, of uh, the knowledge of good and evil, they're like one of us, lest they touch the tree of life and they live forever, let's stop them. And so what God does is that God will stop them, and as the Lord stop them, we don't see the tree of life, the Bible says that the tree of life was guarded by children. And look at what we see the tree of life in the book of Revelation. And um, we see that particularly in the Revelation. Um, just go to, let me see, uh, yeah, go, to, go to the next one. And this is what we see here. This is the last book of the Bible, and this is what we see. And he said, And he showed me a pure river of water, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God 
and of the land. In the middle of the, of the street, and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, and each tree yielded its fruit every month. So we lost the tree of life in the garden, where we find it at the end. So now the journey begins, where we're going to have to access that tree of life again. It was offered to us in the beginning, we completely blew it, we messed it up. Now we're going to have about, I don't know, how many thousands of years before we access the tree of life here. So you can see that in between is where the whole idea of the kingdom message comes in. Because the first kingdom, which is about the perfect kingdom, where we live in that garden paradise with God, where, you know, we are these human beings who live forever, this is the messed up. And so therefore, pain and suffering and everything else follows after that. But God wants to bring us back to the tree of life. And in order to bring us back to that tree of life, where we live forever with Him, there has to be a new order. And that new order is to do with the kingdom that God wants to bring. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you. Let's pray. Father, when we look at your word and we listen to what the Spirit says, Lord, we amaze at your heart or at your intention. How from the beginning your desire for us is that we may live forever. Not only that we may live forever, but we may live life to the full. You say that the enemy comes to steal, to kill and destroy. But you came that we may have life. Life in full abundance, Lord. And Father, we are grateful for your gift of life. We are grateful that, Lord, you didn't give up on your original plan, your desire, Lord, to one day be with us and dwell with us. But, Lord, you provided a way through Christ Jesus. And Father, as we are on this journey looking at your kingdom and the good news of your kingdom, Lord, I pray that you continue uh, to reveal the secrets, the mysteries of the kingdom. You said to the disciples that they were given the grace to know the mysteries of the kingdom. And so, Lord, as we looked at the mysteries of the kingdom, I pray that you will continue to teach us. You continue to shed light on those things, that we may learn, that we may know and understand, Lord, why we're here. Because, Lord, we're here for a reason. You, you, you allow us to be alive for such time as this, Lord, to play an important role in bringing about the best that you have for man. Your desires that we may live and live forever, Lord. Father, I pray that we'll appreciate the fact that your desire is for us to abide in you, that we may live by every word that comes from your mouth. So I pray, Lord, that you bless our intimacy, our fellowship with you, Father. And as we continue this service, Lord, be with us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.